God bless you guys. Good morning, Spark Church. How's everybody doing? Are you guys awake this morning? What? Hey, can we give it for the dads? Happy Father's Day to the dads. Man, if there's anything, you know, this world needs, we need, you know, less baby daddies and more fathers, right? And so, let, like, let's celebrate dads, those that are, that are there, that are helping, that are, you know, providers, that are loving, that are nurturing, and that's, that's what we need, especially in a neighborhood like Bushface, where uh, this, the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of fatherless homes, right? There's a lot of incarcerated dads in, in, in neighborhoods like Bushwick and Bushwick itself, and we need fathers to step up into the plate, and the Bible has a lot to say about that, and it calls us men out. And it pulls our card, and that's and that's what we need. We need like the men of God to rise up and to step into that role of a father. So we want to celebrate dads today. And to do that, the only way I know to celebrate dads is with hot dogs. So I have the church guys come around, <laughs> grab a hot dog, we're gonna have cake to celebrate. It's like Andrea, one of our very own, she's not here today, but that didn't stop her from baking the cake for us. And she baked us a huge cake that looks like the coffee one. In fact, it's a super dad on it. We'll take a picture after, after, after I speak. Go back and take a picture. <laughs> and then before we, you know, cut it up into designer pieces and enjoy it. And then uh, hit up on Instagram later and thank you for doing that. Let me start off by asking you guys a question. And the question is this. How do you make it to heaven? How do you make it to heaven? How does one experience salvation? How does that happen? And guys, if you were to walk to anybody in the street, anyone in the street and ask them this question, do you know the type of responses that you get? Uh, you get quite an array of responses. If you could get a person to agree on the basis that, at the very least, at the very minimum, that there is a God, and that there's a promise of salvation in heaven someday, they might just say that the way to get to heaven, the way to experience salvation, is by being a good person. And the majority of people have that belief. In fact, you can look up countless YouTube videos of people asking that question in the street, how do you get to heaven, how do you experience salvation? And they'll say, well, it's by being a good person. In fact, the other day I was having a conversation with a gentleman at Maria Hernandez Park. This guy has an amazing story, by the way. I think I shared this a couple weeks ago. I apologize if, uh, if I did. I'm getting a little see now. I forget what I say. I repeat things over and over again. But I had this conversation with this guy at the park, and he had an amazing story about how he journeyed from being a drunkard at Maria Hernandez Park to now living a life of sobriety and having a job and contributing to society. An amazing story this guy had. And he mentioned he was a Christian. I said, man, you have a great story. I asked him, that's amazing. How does one become a Christian? How did that happen? How do you become a Christian? How do you experience salvation? I asked him the question. How do you get to one day spend all eternity in the presence of God? His answer was, again, I told you, I have an amazing story, but his answer was this. Do good, be a good person, and try to live your life like Jesus. His response was very similar to many responses I've heard. And I, and I told him, I said, man, you know, live, live your life like Jesus? That's a high bar. Because Jesus was sinless and perfect. How, how are you doing with that? Are you doing your life? Right? And, and he couldn't quite answer that. You know, in fact, uh, if I were to ask you guys the question, a lot of you have that same response. How do you get to heaven? Will you be a good person? Some of you, if that was the question, then I were to ask you, you would say the same thing. You would probably answer the same way. But is that the right answer? I think Paul would disagree. We've been in this series, and this is week seven, guys, of fake news. And as a church, we've been working our way through one letter. What's the name of that letter? The letter is? You guys haven't been here. Guys, but there's a, there's a book in the Bible in the back in the New Testament called Galatians. And for the past seven weeks, we've been there. So, uh, we, a month and a half, we've been in the same book, the book of Galatians, uh, almost two months now. And we've been working our way. And the big idea of this letter to the churches in Galatia is that there's only one good news. And all of the other Gospels, they're fake news. That's why we call the series fake news. There's only one Gospel. Now, if you guys remember, those of you that were here last week, Paul spoke about a confrontation that we have with Peter. And Peter was one of the original 12 disciples and a, a prominent leader within the early church. However, Peter had been led astray and was participating in the rejection of the essence of the Gospel. So Paul writes this letter to pull his cards a little bit. To say, Peter, you, you're messing up. You're saying some wrong things here. You see, a message was, had penetrated the churches in Galatia. The church was extremely messy. You had Jew and Gentile coming together all under the banner of Jesus. And of course, everyone brought a little bit of their cultural differences to the table. And many Jews especially had held on to a particular tradition. So, some traditions that they brought to the table that they were used to. 
Now, among them was this religious sect that had spread the message that Jesus is work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin and newness of life, that it wasn't enough. Jesus' work on the cross, his death, life, resurrection, guys, it wasn't enough according to this religious sect. And in fact, in addition to Jesus, they said, you also had to practice circumcision. And guys, you can imagine for a 30-year-old Gentile, right, to say, what? I have to, I have to be what? So that in light of Father's Day, can all the men, can you guys all say, ouch, one, two, three? Ouch. Right? Can you guys imagine hearing that? Hey, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He loves you. Give your life to him. And get circumcised. Right? Can you guys imagine that? But Paul confronts Peter and the other religious leaders falsely spreading the message and brings them back to the gospel. He brings them back to the essence. And he tells them, guys, the moment you add anything to the good news, it becomes fake news. Right? It becomes fake news. The moment you add anything to Jesus. But listen, guys, I kind of understand where these religious folks are coming from. Let me explain. Don't, don't you guys kind of see it? And in fact, in most of the conversations that I have with people, they tie religion or closeness to God or salvation to a good person. In other words, to be a good person. In other words, they tie salvation to works. Oftentimes, that, that, there's a connection between the two. Right? What do folks mean when they say that? What do they mean when they say to be a good person? What they mean that you have to earn your way to salvation by basically being a good person. And you can't experience salvation, you can't experience eternity in heaven, you can't have forgiveness of sin without being a good person, without doing something. But nothing, guys, can be further from the truth. This is what Paul is saying in these verses over and over and over again. But the temptation is to reduce the gospel of Christianity down to a list of do's and don'ts. And if you're, if you're able to abide by the rules, then you feel pretty good about yourself. However, if you don't, which most of us won't, we can beat ourselves up. No matter how you slice it, both options are a false gospel. And in today's passage, Paul is going to help us dive a little deeper into understanding this. And that's what I pray and hope, that for every single one of us here, as we read these verses, that we'll be able to see the point that Paul is making here. So for the rest of our time, we're going to look at three simple things. You guys are already beginning to smell the hot dogs, and I know you want it. All right, but we're going to do these three things, and then you guys can go for those hot dogs. Three things that we want to pull out from Galatians 2, 15 to 21. Here's number one. Here's a good time to take out your message notes and some fill in the blanks there. I love the hearing the click the pins. I love to hear that. I hear the click the pins because that means you're taking notes. Here's number one. We are not justified by works, but by faith in Jesus. We are not justified by works, but by faith in Jesus. Look how it says in Galatians 2, 15 and 16. 15 says, it's in your notes and on the screen. It says this. We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. You guys notice that in the CSB Bible, they put Gentile sinners in quotes. You guys catch that? But what Paul is saying says, we're Jews by birth. In other words, the Jews forever in the Old Testament, they had the promise of salvation, the Abrahamic covenant, right? They had the promise of being God's chosen people. And he said, we're Jews by birth, and we're not Gentile sinners, and he put it in quotes. In other words, if you were Gentile, if you were not a Jew, then there was no hope for you. You weren't part of God's covenant. He said, we are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners, and yet, because we know, the, the Jews, because we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. These are huge words, guys. He's saying forever in the Old Testament, we were part of God's family just because we were Jews and we had the circumcised covenant and we were part of the family of God. But you know what? We realize under the new covenant and because of Jesus, we too, even the Jews, we're sinful and we need Jesus too. And so we can't just simply keep the law. Even as law-abiding Jews, we also need faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says this in verse 16. Read this out loud with me together with great Father's Day enthusiasm. Read it for your dad. Okay, ready, go. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Now here's what Paul is saying. Not only is he saying we are not justified by works, but that... We cannot be justified by works. In other words, it is impossible. It is an impossibility 
Now, to truly understand this, we have to define a few words because perhaps for the most part, for many of us, there are words that here that you probably don't use in your everyday vocabulary. Here's the first word. The word is works. You want to circle it in your notes. For those of you that like to take extra notes, you can circle it wherever you see that. Works. You circle it everywhere you see it in the person. Now, what is that? What is Paul referring to when he says works? Is he talking about your day job? Is he talking about the mailman, the MTA worker? What is he talking about when he says works? What he's saying is works is anything that you feel you must do in order to experience salvation. Anything you do in order to experience salvation. It's anything apart from having faith in Jesus. Anything that you do apart from having faith in Jesus. In this case, right, let's, let's bring it to the example of the churches in Galatia. It looked like those Jewish leaders who were telling the Gentile Christians that in order to be saved, they had to do works. What was their works? You guys know it? It was, you guys remember, start with a C, start with a C, and with an circumcision. Circumcision, right? He said that was the work. He said you can't be saved unless you are circumcised. That was the work that they had to do. Now, guys, the truth is that this still exists today. Maybe not the whole circumcision bit, but, but in the same exact scenario, but there's people that believe you have to keep certain rules and regulations in order to experience salvation. In other words, that is not just by faith in Christ alone. That is not just by experiencing faith in Jesus Christ, by surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and giving Him your life. That there's works that you have to do. Now, you might be here today, and you might be struggling with this fact right now. I, some of you, I see your brains working. You're like, Danny, what? You, there, there can't be, a, there, there's no way that you can experience salvation without some sort of payback. There has to be some sort of payback, Danny, right? It, and it could be, maybe you're thinking that because we live in such a transactional society. And the idea of getting something for nothing doesn't make sense. As a church, guys, we do outreaches all the time, and we give out bottles of water, bottles of water we give out granola bars, and we try to invite people to church and such, right? We'll go to Myrtle Wyckoff, and we'll give out several hundred granola bars. And a lot of times while we're doing that, we're giving out a granola bar. We say, free granola bar, free granola bar. And a lot of people, they, they go like this. I, I don't have any money. They assume that we're selling the granola bar to them. They, they can't register the fact that we're giving them something free. A lot of times, they're so used to people standing on the corner selling stuff that they ignore us completely. Other times, they'll take the granola bar and they'll be like, are you trying to poison me? What is in this? Did you put some rat poison in here or something? Are you trying to, like, you know, mass murder, like, a bunch of people here in Bushwick? And we tell them, no, it's free. We're just a church in the community. We want to bless you. People don't understand. They don't register something for nothing. And if we're going to receive this amazing gift of God's grace, then, then we oftentimes we think, well, obviously, then there has to be something we have to do to earn it. There's no way that this is a free gift because nobody gets something for nothing. And, guys, we're New Yorkers, Right? Ain't nobody going to bamboozle us, right? We know. We well, you know the deal, right? And so we always think that there must be something. No, we can't get something for nothing. It doesn't make sense. I have to. So it's the same thing with our salvation. It's the same thing with my relationship with God. We think that we have to earn our way to salvation. But what is Paul saying? We are justified. We are not justified by works, but by faith. The second term that we need to understand is the word justified. Go ahead and circle it everywhere that you see it in the notes. He says it maybe like three times in those verses. It's a common word that he says it. And in fact, in all of Paul's writings, many scholars believe that this is the first time he introduces this term to us in the Bible. Justified is a legal term. And what it means, it means to be declared righteous. Not to be righteous, but to be declared righteous. And we are declared righteous through Christ and that's apart from anything that we do. We are not justified or, we are de or declared righteous by works, but by faith in Jesus. Because at the end of the day, the only one that has power to save, guys, is Jesus. He is the only one that has the power to save. Only Jesus has the power to forgive. So only through Jesus can we be justified. And guys, this is good news for us. Because no matter your sin, it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your life. It doesn't matter what you did. What you did moments before you walked through the doors of the church. You can experience God's mercy. You can experience forgiveness simply by putting your faith in Jesus. The second thing that we learn from Paul's writing is this, number two in your notes. That freedom in Christ is not a license to sin. Freedom in Christ is not a license to sin. 
And Paul says it this way in verse 17 through 19. He says, But if we ourselves are also found to be sinners while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Read these two words with me, and there's an exclamation point. Read it how he wrote it. Ready, go. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. All right? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Now, guys, these are confusing three verses, right, if we're honest. And it was so hard for me to try to simplify this, but I'm going to try my best. You see, Paul is answering an objection here. He's answering an objection that is made by the circumcision party, which was that if we're saved by grace through faith in Christ and not by the law, then doesn't that mean, Paul, that, you could, that people could do whatever they want? They can go about living a crazy life. They can sin all they want. And according to you, Paul, they're saved by faith in Christ, and it doesn't matter what they do. So they can live a crazy life. In other words, you're giving them a good excuse to live however they want. And what did Paul say? Absolutely not. But some of you are raising that same objection. Because for some of you, this is the first time you hear this. This is the first time you hear that the gospel is a free gift of God's grace. And that there's nothing that you can do to earn it. And within you, there's this objection that raises up. You hear about the grace of Christ. And you cannot earn salvation or forget us of sin. And you're like... There's two ways. Well, some of you are like, "Woo! I'm saved by grace. I'm going to go party tonight. Like, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to wake up, like, you know, piss drunk in the middle of Bushwick somewhere. I'm going to live a crazy life because, hey, I'm saved by grace. Some of you hear it that way. That's what you think. Others of you, you're more cautious, like the religious leaders, and, 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 you're, and you hear what Paul is saying, and you're like, but Danny, if you say that, then, then people are going to live however they want, and they're gonna, there's going to be no change, and they're gonna be, you're giving them a license to sin. But Paul says, absolutely not. Freedom in Christ does not give you a license to sin and do whatever you want. You see, the law, Paul says, this is what he's talking about. The law showed him his sin and showed him his inability to keep the law. He says that through the law, I die to the law. You see, the law isn't bad in itself. Right? The Ten Commandments. Are the Ten Commandments bad? Right? Right? The Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not lie. Anybody have an objection to not lying? The Ten Commandments says, don't, don't steal. Anybody have a moral objection to not living in a life, you know, not stealing? Right? The, the, the Ten Commandments says, don't covet. Right? Anybody have a moral objection to not coveting your neighbor's stuff? Right? It says, don't commit adultery. Anybody like, no, take my wife, right? You can like, go ahead. Nobody has a moral objection to that. The Ten Commandments are basic, but the law shows you that you can't keep the law. Because no matter how simple the law is, you still lie, and you still cheat, and you still covet. And that's what Paul is saying. The law isn't bad. The law reflects the good and moral heart of God. But it shows me that no matter how hard we try, we can't keep the entirety of the law. We are hopeless. We are hopeless. So for Paul... The law ultimately, what he said, it ultimately killed him so that he could live for God. The law showed him his inability to keep the law. The law showed him his condition, which was before a holy and righteous God, spiritually dead. And for us, the truth is the truth that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ and not our works. It doesn't give us a license to sin. Instead, you know what that should do? It should birth within us a new desire. A new desire to not live for ourselves and not to live for our selfish desires and the sinful desires of this sinful flesh. In fact, you can say that one of the signs of true genuine conversion is having less of a desire to please the sinful desires of your flesh and more of a desire to please God and live according to His plans and His purposes. So accepting God's precious gift of grace in Christ Jesus is not a free license to live a licentious sinful life. Instead, it's this. Number three in your notes. Our freedom leads to abandoning sin and honoring God. Our freedom leads to abandoning sin and honoring God. Let's read this verse out loud with me together. I let you guys off the hook. I said to read it for your dads or in honor of your dads, and you guys let me down. Let's do it today. Let's read this verse nice and loud. You guys ready? This is Galatians 2.20. You have it in the notes and on the screen. Ready? Go. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
You see, guys, Paul explains what happens when we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We no longer live for ourselves. Instead, we live for the Lordship of Jesus. We no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for our pleasures. We no longer live for our desires. Instead, we surrender our will to God and we conform to the image of Christ every day more and more. On the cross, Jesus absorbed God's wrath and judgment, not because of anything Jesus did, but for what we've done because of our sin. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. We deserve the punishment, but instead Jesus took it in our place. And as a follower of Jesus, we have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? It means that the weight of our sin, that which kept us eternally separated from, from the God who created us and loves us, was defeated. The sin that separated us from God was crushed by Christ on the cross, and we are crucified with Jesus. And through Christ in us and through the power of God's Spirit, we can experience not only the freedom from the weight of sin, but also the power, the control, and the dominion that it has over us. And our freedom leads us to abandon sin and to honor God with our lives. And today, no matter who you are, you have the opportunity to experience this freedom in Christ. And it doesn't happen through your good works. Because salvation is not based upon church attendance. It's not based upon any rituals. It's not based upon any habits. It's not based upon tradition. It is only through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And guys, I know. I know. For some of you, this is such a difficult doctrine to grasp. For some of you, it's a difficult thing to grasp. Either because, because either for all your life or because, or because perhaps whatever religious tradition you came from, you were taught that God was angry at you and that it's your job to repay your sin through various works, maybe through penance or through confession or through baptism or through some other ritual. You have to pay back God because He's angry at you. But the key is found in what Paul says. What did he say? I live by faith in, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Jesus loves you and God is not angry at you. He's not in heaven waiting for you to repay him for the wrong that you have done. Listen, it, it sounds like a good idea. But the problem is that our sin debt it's simply too big of a, of a bill for you to pay. And you just don't have enough capital in the bank. It's too big of a bill. And the only way that we could truly be made right before God is to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And for some of you, this is hard to grasp. Today's Father's Day, and maybe Father's Day is difficult for you to understand because you didn't have a great relationship with your dad. Or because your dad was a, the, you know, an angry father that yelled at you, that was always angry at you. And so Father's Day rolls around and you get tense and you don't really enjoy celebrating this day. And some of you, because it's so easy, the relationship we have with our dad, to pass that on to our relationship with God. And we say, well, my, my dad was an angry God, so my, my father in heaven must be an angry father, and he's angry at me, and he's upset at me, and I have to kind of always be on my, on, on walking on eggshells and on, on, my, on my P's and Q's to try to please him. But guys, God is not like that. God is a loving father. And no matter what you do, you cannot repay what he did. What do you do? You receive it. The moment that we think that we can some way, somehow earn our place in heaven or earn God's love or, or pay for the forgiveness of our eternal sin debt, then we cheapen the power of the cross. The cross is way more expensive than whatever it is that you think you can do to earn it. And this is what Paul said. It was the last verse. Let's read it out loud. The last verse to end out chapter 2. Ready? Go. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Guys, if you were able to earn righteousness, if you were to somehow earn your one-way ticket to heaven, then Jesus' perfect life, His horrific death, His powerful resurrection would have been for nothing. But you could say 30 Hail Marys, get baptized, confess your sin, and be good. Then why did Jesus come? 
But because our salvation is not contingent on works, but by Christ's work, we can rest in God's grace and mercy. We can rejoice in His love. And if you're here today, and maybe you've had a works-based understanding of the gospel, that's what you thought good news was. That's what you thought Christianity was. That's what you thought Jesus was. You thought it was all about works-based. Then I want to help you understand something. You cannot earn your way to heaven or restore your relationship with God through good works. Then Danny, how do I do it? Easy. It's by putting your faith in Christ's work, not in your own. It's putting your faith in Jesus. It's receiving God's free gift of grace in Christ. When we're giving out granola bars on Myrtle and Wyckoff, all I expect my neighbors to do is just to grab it. It's free. They just have to receive the free gift. You guys pay for it. When you guys give to church, you pay for that so that they can give it. And when it comes to salvation, when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to an eternity in the presence of God, all you have to do is receive it. You do so by putting your faith in Jesus. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to reflect on that. And for some of you, God is tugging at your heart. And maybe you had a works-based theology or understanding of who God is. And today, you understand that it's not by works, that it is through what Christ has done for you. That I'm going to call you to repent of sin and to trust in Christ. Put your faith in Jesus. Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. I'm going to give you some time to reflect on that. And I'm going to ask that we all pray together collectively. Would you guys join me? In this prayer. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Just consider. The goodness of Jesus. He is mighty to save. Father forgive us. For thinking that we can somehow. Earn our way to you. It's impossible. God how foolish of us to think that we could ever chisel away at the massive sin debt that we've acquired. But I thank you, God, that you are a good father, that you are gracious. I thank you for being such a loving father who provides a way for his children to be restored, to be forgiven, and to be welcomed into his arms through Jesus.